failure, I would work harder. And that's one of the things that you'll find a lot with people that suffer from addiction. They're, you see a ton of brilliant people, I'm not saying I am, but you see a ton of brilliant people and a ton of hardworking people that suffer from this addiction and lose everything because they think they can fix it themselves. And we can't. Some of us can't. Some can, but some of us can't. Okay. And I was one that couldn't. And I thought the harder I would work at it, you know, we would take 30 days off. I would quit drinking for 30 days at a time. See, look, I can't be an alcoholic. I can do it on my own. Oh, and that's... The opinions expressed in the following program are those of the producer and not necessarily those of WKTV Community Media. Hello, West Michigan. This is Grand Tap Media Business TV. My name is Pamela Keim, your host. The spirit of the show is to introduce West Michigan to all the businesses, nonprofits, individuals that can help us thrive in our lives. We have a great guest for you today, and this is more of a, of a help to maybe people that are suffering today uh, through COVID or have some kind of addiction and starting to lose control of their lives and maybe even experienced have lost everything due to drug addictions, alcoholism. And I want to share with you today Derek Jowden, and he is going to talk about his book, the Thawing Man, which is on its third edition. Yes. I saw that, which is yep. kind of exciting. And a talk about how you went from a professional business owner to self-medicating yourself, to losing your family, losing your business, and ending up living in a pole barn. Yep. Yeah, so I want to share, welcome you to, this, to the show, Derek. Thank you. All right, I want to talk, so talk about who you are and what, what the heck <laughs> happened because you had uh, listening to you and reading your book you had everything i did that the american dream would want yeah and so maybe some people are like what were you doing self-medicating yourself when you had things that people would have dreamed to have it never and that's a great great starting point Pamela. right it is you never know what's going on behind the scenes no matter what and you know my drinking started early and it wasn't just for trauma i didn't have any trauma i had a great childhood my mom and dad are loving they were best friends right until my, I lost my dad. I mean, they stayed in touch even after the divorce. They were just, I had a beautiful family life. I grew up in the country. I grew up, I mean, it just, I couldn't have had a better growing up experience. Right. I had a noisy mind. We didn't know about that back then when I was a little kid. Are you kid. saying ADD? Yeah. And, and that, was there signs in your schooling? Was it? There was, but I was a straight A student until I hit puberty, perhaps found girls. Mm -hmm. um, and then I lost focus right but every report card would say great student loved to have him in the class needs to apply himself because I thought about so many other different things than what was at hand so that noise that constant on wears on a person after a bit of time and so I started using alcohol to quiet that down and when did that down. start I can remember drinking when I was 15 and 16 was that introduced through peer your you know, yeah. your friends yep did you go to a party at yeah. somebody's home? It was at parties. I mean, that was what we did back in high school. We'd find a field out in the country and build a bonfire and everybody get a beer and sit and, and what visit. Did you, what did you feel like when you first did? Because I'm, you, we've just talked just in the mm -hmm. last few days. Yeah. I am, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, excitable. I've got a lot of passion for what I do in the show. And I remember when I first took the first, during the high school years, was introduced to a friend. Mm -hmm. Your friend introduced it to me. And I was just like, wow, the world just calmed down. Yeah. I can, um, but there's a tipping point, I will tell mm -hmm. you. But it, that was what I felt. But you know what I feared is that I would lose, you have this sense when, you, when, you're, self, self, when you're super aware, mm -hmm. you're super hyper, you are more aware of everything around you. Did you, how'd that go? That was okay too because I never feared losing control. Never felt that never was worried about it. That's p one of the problems with um, certain addictions, certain wirings of each other's brains. I didn't worry about that. Now, I've, as you go through life and as you get older and visit with more people, that's something that I find more common, that people didn't like the feeling of drinking because they didn't want to lose control. That was never a problem for me. Well, and then Because you... I didn't care about being in control. <laughs> I didn't mind. So how was your high, how, okay, so first of all, being an A student, mm -hmm. that was really, you know, I really commend you with having all the super awareness, attention issues. A lot of people don't have that. Mm -hmm. 
they suffer in school because they can't focus. So you had that good thing going for you. Mm -hmm. That now was did, just another one. You know, so how was high school and did it start to increase and you started seeing that you looked forward to the weekends, looked forward to that? What, how did that look? High school was great. And, that, and I hear people complain about high school today. And that was my most fun years. I had so much fun in high school. I worked on a dairy farm in the okay. summer and part time in the off season and in a law firm. So I had two jobs in high school. Everything was good. I had great friends. I had great activities. I ran cross country, skied cross country, had all these big plans to go forward into marketing and engineering and all these different things because I liked everything. I was interested in everything and that was a problem that lack of focus, but when I was focused on something, I could do it really well. Wow, that's really nice. And then, so you may, managed to get through high school years. You had mm -hmm. a great time. Yep, and right? lots so of Right, so no, no really abuse there where you were skipping class because you were drinking the night before, no. or anything like that. Nope, that wasn't allowed. I mean, we couldn't, that was reinforced. I mean, our parents didn't support our drinking habits, so we'd have to sneak. I mean, it wasn't something we put in front of their face. We'd have to sneak off and do it. and. I'm and you gonna, and you had to keep it in check because you mm -hmm. had to go back home. Yeah. So you had to. I can imagine what you know. I wasn't a huge partier. I just saw other people do it mm -hmm. and come to school and talk about it and things like that. I'm like, oh no, I could never do that. I was kind of a, a shy girl, even though I seem <laughs> outgoing. But I was very shy when it came to that. All right. So you make it through high school. Yep. All right. Without any really drunk drivings and. Probably you and I growing up, it wasn't as big a deal as it is now. Not now. Yeah, it is a big, um, there's a big hit with that. All right, so you go off to college? Went to community college for two years, then I went up to Northern in Marquette. Okay. Started up there, and then drinking wasn't bad because I was working and going to school, I didn't have any money. So I didn't have any time <laughs> to go drinking beer. I was working right. a night shift job. I was a janitor at night, and that was an extra 50 cents an hour. So I needed that extra money. So I didn't have any time at night to party, and all day was school. So, so you made it through that. You did pretty well in school, obviously. Not really. I didn't care for college. At that point, I knew it wasn't for me. And my dad and I started a firm, and he wanted me to go back to school. He's like, that's the deal. We'll start this company, but you're going to go finish your degree. And what was the company for? Tech. My tech. Dad, dad was an engineer with IBM, so we started a technology company in Alpena doing for network. Your dad that was an engineer for IBM? Yeah. Gosh. You know, just even even hearing that, it's like, wow, that's a great, you know, opportunity. Oh, yeah. You know, so you were excited about this business, mm -hmm. going back to college? Yeah. I worked so hard that whole summer that I, we were too busy for me to go back to school. I did not want to go back, so I made it so we couldn't. You did that on purpose? Yes. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> How many people would do that? You must have really not cared. Well, you probably knew that it was. It you, wasn't for me. Right. And there was a Hands sweetheart. On. At, yeah. Oh, there was I, a sweetheart? Yeah, there was a sweetheart in Alpena. I ended up marrying her. Okay. So we were together, married almost 15 years, together almost 20. Okay. And two kids. Um, the business took off. The business was going crazy well. Um, but we also vacated. That was in Alpena. But we vacationed in Charlevoix. That's where my ex-in-laws were. And we'd always wanted to live there. It was a beautiful area. And so I thought, okay, in 2000, we had a baby. And I'm that guy that let's just keep doing, let's do it all. Let's do it all. We're not going to be careful. We're just going to go for it. Okay. And at that time, my wife was the same. She seen me be successful in whatever we tried. So we decided to make the move. There was a lot of pressure. That's when the market went right straight to hell. And I was a financial planner at that point. What year was that? 2000. Oh, okay. And then right. 2001, we had 9-11 that shut down the markets. And I could just watch our savings because we owned a house in Alpena. One in Charlevoix, we were just, the market was tanking. I mean, it actually shut down when 9-11 hit. We, all trading stopped. Well, so, how many days was that? Do you remember? I can't remember if it was four, three okay. or four. It was a significant amount of time. It was, well, everything, you know, I was a, uh, a young mother during that time and kids and that I just needed to get them to A to B and we wanted some kind of feel of normal right. life back. Yeah. And, but I never really, you know, the financial wasn't affecting me because right. I wasn't that age. Right. And you always think you can bounce back. Yeah, because you, know, you always can. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> but anyway, so then you started and that's when, when you started seeing your savings go, you like, how, how do I cope with this? It was more and more alcohol at that point. That's when the coping really fired up. When I saw the savings go down business suffer. I'd never had any struggles like that before. I'd never come up against anything that difficult. New baby, new home, new t 
town. It wasn't surrounded by people I knew. These were all strangers at the first, you know, because when you move to a new town, you don't know people like that. that. Well, yes. You grow up in a small town like Alpena, you know everybody. And Absolutely. It takes a we, we know, I know people <laughs> yeah. that you found out you knew and got, uh, you went to school with and things like that. That's how we got introduced. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, yes, but did you, did your, did, how close were you to your parents? Did Very. I mean, my dad and I were best friends. My mom is my rock, my anchor. She's the most wonderful human. You would love her. She would make you a cake right now, and you would just <laughs> oh, be I the most. Guy. <laughs> she would anything you wanted. She would give you, right? The shirt off her back if you needed it. She'd find a way to get one tomorrow. So you start self-medicating yourself, and what, how is that affecting your family, your wife? Horribly. That's when things really started to go to hell. I was start. I was a high-functioning alcoholic. I mean, I think. It's in my family. Genetically, it's in my family. It is? Oh, bad. Not my dad, not my mom, but they're, like my dad's brother, he was. Um, it went beyond them, you know, to my mom's father. He was a very bad alcoholic. So I think sometimes that addiction is a genetic coding. I wish we could find that piece of the DNA and turn it off, but we haven't found that yet. Well, it's not very good for people. Even if we did, I mean, what are you, people that come from an alcoholic family, there's no hope. That is, you're, you're better off to have, I've heard people say, I won't even want to take a drink. Right. Because Too risky. Um, of what it did to my, like you said, mm -hmm. my brother, my uncle, yeah. you know, there's, there's a former president that said the same thing. I wasn't going to go down that road yeah. on that one. All right, so your wife is what? Start nagging you? What does she, this look like? She didn't. She was great. And, uh, you know, I'll own that divorce. That was on me. I've fought depression. Things weren't going well. Were you on medication? Nope. I tried it okay. once and it did not go well. I didn't care for it. I didn't like that loss. Now that's when I didn't like the loss of control. It numbed you so hard that you, my brain, I was working so hard, I'd have to take a nap. This one I still had the financial practice at two o'clock every day, quick 20 minute nap, change shirt, change white shirt. I had a fresh shirt every day because I would just be exhausted from trying so hard to focus. So I got rid on of that. On medication. Mm -hmm. I was on it for 30 days and I couldn't do it. Well, it's, doesn't it take 90, they say? Probably. <laughs> I'm an overachiever, Pamela. <laughs> is that what the, <laughs> do you think that that was one of the things is yeah. that you wanted results? Quickly. So quickly? Mm -hmm. Like we all, don't we all? If I have a headache and I take an aspirin and I still hurt in two minutes, I have to go take another one. <laughs> <laughs> now, how, are you, how old are your children at this time? Um, well, when the divorce happened, my son was 19 and my daughter was 12. Oh, your son was 19. So, mm -hmm. okay, he was out of the home? He was out of the house. He had his own place and has started his own little business. He's doing great. Well, he must have learned from dad, you know? Yeah, he you know? Well, you said you were in financial. What happened to the tech business with your dad? Did that change up? I had to sell my shares to join the financial firm. The, uh, the tech company sold in seven years ago. Dad was just wanted something to do after he retired and ended up doing it for a long time. Okay. And, go, and that was good, that, that put some money in your pocket too when you did all that, right? That was just a transfer shares. It wasn't a sale. Oh, okay. But you, but you got the entrepreneur kind of, yeah. got a bug. And then you yeah. went into finance and that's when you, after 9-11, which a lot of people mm -hmm. did. I think we're going to be, you're probably seeing that with COVID. Mm -hmm. Kind of the same kind of crash or 2008. Yep. Um, which is, you know, it's like it, for a decade. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's, <laughs> it's just, been a while. <laughs> it's been, yeah, it's been, it's been crazy. All right, so then you get your, you believe you caused the divorce because you yeah. what? You didn't, you didn't see the signs. A, you didn't, we've, you didn't want to believe somebody of your professionalism could I'd end up like this. Never ever failed. If I started to get to the edge of failure, I would work harder, and that's one of the things that you'll find a lot with people that suffer from addiction. There, you see a ton of brilliant people. I'm not saying I am, but you see a ton of brilliant people and a ton of hardworking people that suffer from this addiction and lose everything because they think they can fix it themselves. And we can't, some of us can't. Some can, but some of us can't. Okay. And I was one that couldn't. And I thought the harder I would work at it, you know, we would take 30 days off. I would quit drinking for 30 days at a time. See, look, at, I can't be an alcoholic. I can do it on my own. Oh, I, I, that's, yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's what I hear a lot with people. They'll, you know, what's that drug they take to stop? drinking and abuse and abuse mm -hmm. and I would get a call from them and I'm like oh my gosh she's gonna he's gonna he's been on an abuse for you know he went back on an abuse I'm like okay uh -huh. she goes I think this is good I'm like okay well I'll call me in a 30 you know get with me in the 30 days you know right. whatever see how this goes and it never failed no it, it I think the longest somebody was in the family was a year without drinking 
It's a, there's more behind it. It's not just the alcohol or the drugs or the food or whatever you're addicted to that you're using to self-medicate. There's something underneath it. And when my wife left, I was devastated. Did she um, just walk out the door? No, no, she was, um, she had a place and she was prepared. And there was no counseling. And what, how long time frame did it take before that build up? You started heavily drinking when? Was it a year? No, two it was years? years. Two years? More than that. Where's you? It was plenty. Okay. More than she deserved. Well, it's nice that you take responsibility. Well, you um, have to. A lot of people don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you see that in the world today. Yeah. And then she ends up leaving with your daughter, right? We shared custody of Samantha, um, okay. my daughter. And that worked well in the beginning. Worked well for a few years. And... I stayed, I, I remember I started AA right when my wife moved into her new place and my daughter was with me after school and we would talk about what I learned in AA that day. She was so proud every day. What did you learn today, daddy? That would be the first thing. And I'm like, I want to talk about your school. Tell me about you. Well, then as she spent more and more time with her mom, I would have weekends by myself and that was dreadful. I didn't have my family at home, so I had found something else to do. And that was usually have a drink or two. And then it just By went, yourself? Yep. Okay. And then it went right back to, I better get a couple bottles of scotch because it's going to be Friday and Saturday that I'll be by myself. Kind of lo That loneliness is a killer, isn't it? It is. It People is. don't realize that. It's that lack of hope. I'm like, I'm by myself. I can't see a fix to this. This is not getting better. We're not going to reconcile. When that was final that I knew we weren't going to reconcile, that's when things really went bad. Well, you, can, you try to do something to make it happen, mm -hmm. um, to make it bring together. And when it doesn't, it, you realize. So then, okay, so your parents, are they trying to get you in? Are they seeing a problem or you still think it's controllable after? I think, well, I know they years. both saw it. But they were, like anybody that's not an expert in the field, they were trying their best. And I see that so many times where, you know, well, was your wife enabling you? Were your friends enabling you? No. Not at all. They weren't enabling me. I was a grown up. They were doing the best they could, trying to figure out the best way to manage me and manage relationships. So no, there's no blame on anybody else but the person right here. Did they do an intervention? No, I don't buy those. I don't like those. Those don't work? I don't think so. Okay. The percentage wise, because what I see, I'm the opposite side of the spectrum. I'm not the punitive side, I'm the hope building side. Okay. I don't, the last thing I think an addict, and I'll use addict for that, or someone that's suffering from substance use disorder, if you want to use the technical word, the last thing they need to see is somebody walk in the door that they trust and love. Like, that's your last person. Come in and say, we need to talk. That's, no. <laughs> that's, that sentence, that statement alone, it's like, oh, God. Yeah. You know, it's no it's <laughs> pertaining to you. Yeah. It's got to be something you are. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. And then, and then you go, all right. So now that we're moving the story, you get through, you're separated, you realize you're not going to reconcile. Divorce is Divorce final. Divorce is coming. How did you financially survive that? Poorly. <laughs> not well at all. Okay. Because um, you really didn't have anything to give her because you went through a lot of it, right? Yeah. So she had a great job. She was doing a good job. I was doing a poor job. I couldn't hold anything together of any substance. And that was part of the depression. There was not much else to do. Once I lost the other job, I was like, now what? What do I replace that level of income with? Nothing. And I tried different things and it just didn't work. That was on me. Jumping from couch to couch. Couch to couch, no place, no address. Losing your daughters. Losing everything. All my pride and dignity. So I started thinking, okay, I need to find a job in town that I can get to back and forth. And I started working at a brewery, which is the perfect place for someone that's struggling with alcoholism. <laughs> Went through that. Um, eventually the friend's like, I need you to move out because I have a significant other that would like to live here. So I lost them with that too. Thankfully the person that owned the brewery had a pole barn and it let me stay there. Okay. So now I've gone from this successful person that has earned his way to the top to the bottom. The, there was no running water in the pole barn, nothing. Wow. So I had to sneak out of the pole barn. I had to hide my truck, live there at night, sneak down to the showers at the marina. I mean, it was horrible. So you're living in a pole barn. You're, you know, you went from a business owner, mm -hmm. financials, educated, uh -huh. everything that the American, American would think that that was what you just needed to succeed. Because a lot of people see alcoholics on the streets yep. that are, they call them, you know, winos or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. You don't want to be cruel. That's not you. 
You're no. driving in a car and you are like this <laughs> and you're a functioning alcoholic. Yeah. Yep. And not realizing that you've just lost everything. Nope. All right. So then you wake up and we're going to move to part two. We're going to be talking about what inspired you to finally say, okay. Enough this, is enough. Enough is enough. Yep. Right? Yeah. And that's and and then what that took is it like you were just you know somebody came and picked you up, or you went through through you in a room, and you know well they, well they you know, detox or what do they call it dry out nope. back in the day, no it Look, was all on your accord. It took being caught in the biggest lie in my life. That's what got me to write that book and stop drinking. Get and then help. moving into a whole different career is that, yeah. that you have done? Yep. And helping others. Yes. And that's fun again. I, that was something that's ingrained in my family. We've always been givers and kind people to help others, but I took it to the next level after I saw how bad things could get. So you probably, um, as we wrap this up and we go into part two, talking about the book and what you've been in store since you've been clean for how long? Seven years. Seven years. And what that really takes and how the, how it is when you have, you know, you probably meet those people. They started off really well, mm -hmm. gun hole. You thought they were going to, and they ended up falling off the wagon. Yep. And, and you've dealt with uh, people that are for drug, drug addictions, mm -hmm. alcohol, yep. alcohol, and what else am I missing? Just those are the two I focus on. My primary is alcohol because that's where my experience was. You can help with, once you get to a certain point of study and if you're careful and you watch other people, you can help because it's based in trauma and other things. You can steer them to other people. I can't fix everything, but the network I've built is pretty nice. I have some wonderful people that I work with that I can steer people to. Okay, great. We're going to wrap this up for part one, and we're going to be moving to part two, and we're going to be talking about Derek's book, The Thawing Man, and what it, it took to overcome addiction and get your life back, who started off as decimated into a pole barn, right? Yep. And then able to figure out how to get out of this. And he wrote the book and he hopes it's going to help others that may see themselves in the same situation or pretty close yeah. or realize what's coming. Maybe, Maybe it can keep them from even getting close. <laughs> Maybe we'll get it before they get sick. All right. I want to thank Derek for being here on the show. Uh, you'll be able to find his book if you want to get to it on part one. Where can they find this book? Amazon. Everything's on Amazon. I have an Audible. I did an audio book. There is hardcover, softcover, and Kindle. And Kindle, okay. Mm -hmm. And I and it's and I appreciate um, you being here today, sharing your story. So this is Pamela Kine from Grand Tap Media, and we will catch you on part two with Derek Jowden, and he's going to be talking about his book, The Thawing Man. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.